Karl Grunert was born in 1865. A teacher in Berlin, he would become a writer under the mentor Kurd Laswitz. Besides Laswitz, who was the pioneer of German science fiction short stories, Grunner would be one of the first after him to write in the genre, producing at least 32 works over his career, the amount of stories that have been rediscovered. A number of Grunert's novelettes of the future, what he called his stories, feature Mars or Martians. This is, of course, also the case for his work, The Martian Spy, first published in 1908. So, this was a pretty good story, I think. This one was definitely pretty enjoyable. Yeah, I like this one too. Yeah, so it's very short, and it makes me think, like, there's a couple of anthologies that I have, and there's one that I got, actually, when I was really quite younger, and it was 100 Great Short Short Science Fiction Stories, and I think the editor might be Isaac Asimov, and <laughs> it has a lot of, yeah, like 100 short stories. Very short, like the longest one is probably like six pages or something like that. And there's a few Robert Sheckley stories in there. I think Frederick Brown is in there. Like there's there's a whole bunch of authors, some of whom I've heard of, some of whom I, I not, don't really know. And the shortest story is like one sentence. <laughs> and they're the kind of stories where, yeah, like they are very short. There's not necessarily a lot you can say about them. But they're really good in what they are, and then because they are making a really quick, sharp punch, and they're delivering a very sharp message, or sometimes it's a joke, you know, or something like mm -hmm. it's a little thing with a twist at the end, like a punchline. And this story kind of felt like that. It's just like, it's what you see is what you get, but that's a good thing. For something that's so short and so, like, pointed, it's like, you know, just jabbing you with a sharp stick and going away kind of thing. Like, <laughs> it's good. I like stories like this. I think nowadays, although it's not quite that short, they call it like flash fiction, mm -hmm. where it's just you know, like these really short tales that sometimes leave you thinking or whatever. And then and this this is good. This is probably one of the shortest things we've done on the podcast yet, if not the shortest thing. Yeah. And even though it's so short, it does have several interesting concepts that I think are cool to think about. In particular... There is the same kind of speculation on Martian geography in a similar fashion to like Edison's Conquest of Mars or, or something like that. And that it's yeah. neat to read stories where Mars is like still a total mystery. You know, what could be there? Well, I don't know. Let's make these like crazy assumptions from the bad quality pictures we can get from the telescope about them. And uh, I love that kind of stuff. And there, there's definitely some of that here. Mm -hmm. Additionally, like the last one, there's also some cool talking about like photography equipment and telescopes and lenses and things like that it's just kind of neat and he doesn't spend a lot of time on it but it, he does touch upon it and this one certainly more so than the last two is much 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 more science fiction in mm -hmm. tone yeah another thing that i guess is interesting more for the podcast is this is the first german author we've covered since i think the second time we did Hoffman in episode seven, where we did his story, The Automata, we thought mm, we yes. were going to do a German author with Herman Long, but we instead just got like this weird authorship mystery. But there right. appears to be a fair amount of stuff from Germany coming out of this time, like Gretchen, you mentioned coming from Laswitz, really. <laughs> and the anthology that this story came from, that we read it anyway, the Black Mirror and other stories and anthology of science fiction from Germany and Austria contains like a good six or seven stories from the early period and we're gonna cover a couple of them over the the next several episodes yeah i'm actually really curious to read this kurt blaschwitz writer as well yeah. yes it sounds interesting i know he's written a couple novels some are like kind of longish i think one of them was like hard to find one of them is called between two worlds yeah. or something like that and yeah. it's actually a, sort of a martian invasion story that predates war of the worlds yeah by like a year or something cool but i think it's also like three or four times as long as world of worlds or, or something like yeah, that yeah. I'll, I'll have to mm. check my notes again but yeah we'll, we'll probably be covering more the continental european stuff as we can mm. find it yeah it's also interesting you know we have been spending a lot of the spy and war fiction episodes here talking about germans being the enemy and yes. here we have a, yeah. a german author 
of course, writing about a Martian. Interestingly, the story is set in the United States, though. Yeah. <laughs> Arizona, of all places. <laughs> I don't know if it's known for, like, great observatories. Yeah, I mean, so in 1908, you wouldn't really be getting the light pollution that you would in, like, modern oh, yeah. cities. I mean, at that time, the American West was still pretty undeveloped. You know, a lot of the major cities out there really only got started in, like, the 30s and the 40s and stuff with the modern manufacturing boom. But, yeah, Arizona's a weird place. I mean, you think a German author, you know, sick an observatory up somewhere high in the Alps, and you could see cool stuff. I, 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 I don't know, maybe... Arizona and the West had a good place in the hearts of Germans at the early 1900s. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, funny enough, one of my friends wanted to major in planetary geology mm -hmm. and oh. applied to Arizona State because apparently it's one of the few colleges that really offers that as like a major. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh. So maybe that is a very popular place for some astronomy. Yeah. I, I could tell you the observatory at the university here, you <laughs> can't see anything but the moon. <laughs> yeah. We haven't seen too many observatories yet, surprisingly, on chrononauts. Well, I guess we got the fake one in the moon hoax. Yeah, but there was one big one that I wanted to point out, and that was the observatory at Starkness in Scotland. Yes. In a voyage to Arcturus. <laughs> the awesome punk squatters area for launching spaceships <laughs> with the, like, broken bottles of whiskey and yeah, junk right. everywhere and like <laughs> homebrew cider <laughs> put you in a uk82 yeah. mood really quick yeah so we all we like this and i guess before we get into the plot of what happens in the story i don't think we've read any stories yet about like martian infiltrators mm -hmm. and this would obviously become a theme in much later science fiction right up, right up until the 50s i mean they don't have to be martians but like yeah the aliens you know, among like, us yeah yeah like, like, you know, they're among us, and they're already here, undermining certain aspects of our society, right? It's an interesting trope, and I, I, I don't know, have we done one of these stories on the podcast before? Because I think this one and the next one are kind of the first we've done along these lines. I mean, forget the Martian stuff. I mean, just the idea of, like, you know, the Manchurian candidate replacing another person with a different identity or, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, not really. Of... The closest I can think of is actually that Horatio Korobag. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. story with the the automaton conspiracy mm -hmm. which was just vaguely mm -hmm. hinted at you know frustratingly like not gone into because yeah. <laughs> that was so cool and he just kind of threw it out there yeah. like i don't know that anybody else had even thought of something like that before i don't know you know, like changelings or something yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah it was certainly an interesting idea and early for this kind of stuff i think yeah so this story involves just such a person and i think that both this one and the next one were pretty well chosen to go along with the theme of spy fiction and bring it into our main genre focus. Yeah, I would say this one and the next one are certainly very good companion pieces to one another. Mm -hmm. I really like the next story, actually, like a lot. I realized, I thought about it, and I'm like, yeah, I think this is good. So, <laughs> but we'll talk about that when we get there. Mm -hmm. Why don't we run down, Gretchen, what happens in this one? All right. Well, as we've mentioned, The Martian Spy takes place in an observatory in Arizona, where its director, Mr. Lowell, and his assistants are taking photographs of Mars. Lowell and his assistant, Lampland, while viewing some of the photographs, have noticed a spot on Mars' surface that has shifted positions in each photograph. The two men wait for the development of more photos taken using a lens that will show the surface of the planet even more clearly than before. The photos are being developed by a technician named Ferrum, who is described as having a youthful figure but an old face, and having a black bandage wrapped around his forehead. As Ferrum finishes developing one of the next photographic plates and Lamplin takes it to examine, there is a short circuit, cutting off the light and starting a fire. While they manage to put out the flames quickly, Ferrum knocks into Lamplin, who accidentally breaks the plate. More photographs are taken to replace the one they lost the next night, and upon viewing one of them, Lamplin sees that the spot has a shadow. As he and Lowell await the next photos, Ferrum, who had appeared nervous to Lamplin, replaces the last developing plate with an unexposed one while destroying the other. After discussing the possibility of the spot being an invention created by intelligent beings on Mars, Lamplin checks in on Ferrum and the last plate to find an image has not developed. 
As Ferrum works on the solution the plate is in for Lampland, the latter remarks on his use of rubber gloves while working. After failing to get an image from the plate, the scientists plan to take more photographs that night. While Lampland is alone and observing through the telescope, he hears noises and believes he glances a gleaming in the dark room he's in, but then turns to the main telescope to view and take photographs of Mars. When he looks through, however, he only sees a mist in his field of vision. As he shows Lowell, there is suddenly an explosion that knocks down the two men. Ferrum is seen by Lampland without his bandage, and on his bare forehead is a third eye. Lampland tries to grab him, and Lowell attempts to help, but Ferrum ends up escaping from their grip. They check the telescope and find the lower half destroyed by the explosion, but the upper half is undamaged. Lowell and Lampland then tell the other assistants to find Ferrum, but only find his gloves. In both gloves, the fifth finger is full of padding, showing that Ferrum only has four fingers on each hand. This discovery also prompts Lamplin to say, and I quote, There aren't any four-fingered humans on Earth just at this moment, <laughs> which I don't think is true. No. I'm, I'm sure some people out there have lost a finger on one of their hands, but I digress. <laughs> that was a really strange comment, and I wondered if... Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wondered if that was a translation screw up almost yeah it's, it's phrased just very <laughs> questionably but um this uh, along with the odd appearance and the third eye as well as his suspicious behavior lead them to conclude that ferrum is a martian spy living among them they also find a fragment of the plate ferrum broke up and discover that the spot is a spaceship in the atmosphere of mars and it is heading for earth and on that note, ends The Martian Spy. Yeah, what, what a great ending. Yeah. I know. There's the punch. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, my, favorite, it's, it's my favorite kind of ending for a, like a short, short story. Yeah. The oh shit ending. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're the ones that always stick with you, right? And, and then oftentimes it works really well in a really short story. Yeah. Because it's like, mm. it's like some of those Twilight Zone episodes too, right? Like they kind of end like that. Or it's like... Everything you thought you knew, maybe it was it was hinted at all along. Gretchen, I think you and I were recently talking about that To Serve Man episode. Yes. The It's a Cookbook ending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when you think about it, it's obvious, right? But yeah. it's like the whole time you could go kind of without thinking that in the episode. And there's these little hints and like, you know, every now and then the alien lets out a little smile or something like that at just the right moment. Yeah. And you're like, oh. <laughs> the three eyes and four finger reveal feels very Twilight Zone in characteristics mm. of itself. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. I could see this happening in, in that or like Outer Limits. Totally. One of the yeah. 100%. 60s anthology series. Yeah. One thing I thought that was really cool about this is the name Ferrum for the Martian. Mm. Latin for iron. Source of electromagnetism. They oh, magnetize ah. some yes circuits, and they point. short out, you know, enough. Yeah. Also, iron oxide happens to be a very deep red, which is also kind of like the planet mm. Mars. And humans eat iron sometimes, so why not take a name that you could fit in with them? You know, food's a pleasant thing. <laughs> a very subtle touch for a very short story. I yes. thought that was a, a cool little thing that he put on here. Yeah, I didn't pick up on that. That That's interesting. Yeah, kind of beats Martel the Martian, admittedly. <laughs> <laughs> Who will be featured in the next story. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I don't know. We'll be laughing at that one a lot, but I, I enjoyed it a lot. But anyway, this one was... This was really good. It had that atmosphere of paranoia, too. That atmosphere that, like, there are saboteurs. Yep. Mm. Interesting. Also, as you mentioned, Gretchen, seeing this from the German perspective... Because all the background material that I just painstakingly described in the intro to this episode is all from the British perspective and all, you know, talking about how the Germans are working to sabotage Britain and like, mm -hmm. oh, be, be worried about your waiter at your restaurant there because he might be, might be a spy. They were the bad uh, guys of last episode, too. Right, right. Yeah, a bit of a perspective shift here. Yeah. At first, is like, well, at least he's just sabotaging the apparatus. Maybe he doesn't want humans to know about Mars, but actually there may be an invasion on the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. that's bad. A larger problem than Ferrum. Oh, much. Yeah. 
<laughs> the person that wrote the intro to Grubert in the book of science fiction stories there said that he was very influenced by H.G. Wells. And I think I can sort of even feel that in this short story. Like, mm-hmm. not just because there's a bit of a feeling of War of the Worlds about it, right? Wells often did write short stories like this as well. They're mm-hmm. kind of like mm-hmm. this short little problem, and it's some weird twist at the end, right? Mm-hmm. He has the story, The Star, which maybe we will cover on the podcast sometime, because I do, like, I want to cover some of the Wells short stories as well as the novels, which we have lined up, so. Yeah, I think we have both lined up for the future. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting kind of how that influence permeates. A cool piece of this as well is the glass plate negative aspect. The old mediums that we use to convey information. I mean, nobody uses that stuff anymore, but they're no. very, very oh. commonplace at the time. And I worked with those in one of my internships. And just oh. dealing with them is huge pain. So if you screw up, you break it very, very easily. But at the same time, they hold a great deal of resolution on plate. I mean, they very, very high quality photographs. Mm, really? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting, again, it's a short story and he doesn't really get into the technology too much, but it's cool that he mentions it specifically uh, several times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely curious to read more of him as well. I was pretty intrigued by this story and a part of me wants more. And that's, even though It is a sort of an expression of dissatisfaction in a way. It's a good dissatisfaction. Like, this story was just the perfect length for what it was. Mm -hmm. But it was just like, oh, I want to know more about that. I want to know, like, tell me more about how all this works. What's the Martian thinking? It's it's great. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the only Grunert story that was in that German and Austrian anthology. There were two stories by Laswitz, one of which they describe as like a utopia spiritualist kind of thing. And the other just sounds like really off the wall wacky. So, I mean, we'll probably cover those at some point. But yeah, it'll be interesting to dig further into both those and to see if Gruner has any other stuff that's been translated in English. Because again, like a lot of these other continental European authors, a lot of the stuff just doesn't make its way into English, even into the modern day. You said that only a fraction of Jean Ray's stuff has been translated into English, and that was awesome, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, and just the other day, Nate, you found, we were talking about the film Planet of the Vampires, uh, yes. also known as Terrore dello Spazio, right. I believe, yeah. which is a much sort of more appropriate sounding terror in space, I guess, yeah. in English, because mm-hmm. there's no vampires in that movie. So, no. <laughs> I, I guess more of like but, a... I don't know, philosophical sense? I guess, there's a, yeah, it's sort of a metaphorical yeah, vampirism, right. I guess. But, but Man, what an awesome, awesome movie. But yeah, the original short story has not been translated into English from Italian. Yeah, I think it's from the 50s, maybe, so I don't know what the IP would be like if I could just translate it into English and post it on the internet. I don't think I can, maybe. I found the original Italian on some blog. Italian is a bit of a jump for me. Maybe I'll poke at it. It's surprising that nobody's thought to do it, though. Like, considering that that movie is reasonably... I don't know. I guess I guess it could be better now. Like, I, a lot of the people that I mention it to have never heard of, yeah. of Planet of the Vampires. And when I was poking around for the story, it seems like other people had trouble finding it. So it might be possible that it's only been posted in Italian within the last, like, five or ten years. Uh, to yeah. the internet. I don't know how popular of an author he was or anything like that. It makes me wonder how whoever wrote the screenplay for the film found it, but yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Bava was prolific Italian director who probably had all kinds of scripts from all kinds of genres coming to him. I mean, he's mostly known for his horror yeah. stuff, but he did a couple sword and sandal movies. He did a uh, spy comedy, which I got like five minutes into and it was like really, really bad. <laughs> but uh, his, his horror stuff is like some of the best in the genre, and Planet of the Vampires really toes that line between science fiction and horror. Visually, it's like a major precursor to Alien in some scenes, and there's just some shots that are just like completely breathtaking in it that, yeah, man, what a movie. Yeah. But yeah, the story has not been translated to English. It's in Italian, which is maybe a little bit beyond my capabilities, but maybe not. There's another short story I came across in my research in Catalan, which is also taunting me. <laughs> so i don't know we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens in the future no promises but yeah the stuff is out there that's not been translated and i i suspect that people like gruner and some of the other german authors from the early days have not been translated to english so if you are 
fluent in German and you want to contribute to the global science fiction discourse, we would love to read some of this stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, let us know <laughs> if you if you translate it. We can be the first people to review it in English. Yeah, we'd love to. <laughs> yes. More Carl Grunart would be most welcome. Yeah, I think this is my favorite one from this time around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really good. Cool. Yeah, so definitely look for that one in this anthology, which is the Black Mirror and Other Stories. It, I think, goes up to the present day, but it has like a good six or seven on the early stuff. So mm -hmm. all chronological. And yeah, check it out. Yeah, I think saying too much more about it is like, it's just read it. It's really short. You'll be happy if you like this kind of story. Yeah, so this might be the one out of all of them that if you're going to read, this is the one to read. Cool. Well, I may have more to say about that, but I do agree that it is, it is one to read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the magazines, specifically the earliest American science fiction pulp magazine. Amazing stories. Amazing Stories was a publication of Hugo Jernsbach that got its start in 1926, and it is considered the first English language and perhaps the first, all told, science fiction magazine that is purely devoted to science fiction, or science fiction, as he liked to call it. Jernsbach already had a periodical, Science and Invention, where some fiction was published. And he would be responsible for many other magazines going into the next couple of decades, some of which also published science fiction, such as Air Wonder Stories and Science Wonder Stories. Most of these didn't have the lasting impact of Amazing, except perhaps for Thrilling Wonder Stories, which also started out under his auspices. And I think it had a different name beforehand. I think he actually combined a couple of his wonder magazines into the one because he was trying to save money because he realized he couldn't print all these magazines. So. His engineering periodicals all had a bunch of very similar titles too that merged and converged and split off and remerged back with one another. It's a very complex web of publications he had under his belt. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. So, Jernsbach said, among many other things, that the main purpose of the magazine was to impart knowledge or even inspire without once making us aware that we are being taught. The magazine was hugely influential and important through the second half of the 1920s. In the early days, Jersbach himself was a story editor, and T. O'Connor Sloan, who stayed with the magazine for close to 15 years and was already 74 years old when he joined the staff in 1926, as associate editor and he was involved in the mechanics of publication but sloan also had the job of checking stories for scientific accuracy c.a brandt was also a staff member a german with an extensive library of science fiction at his disposal who selected reprints and apparently did some translations from german especially for the magazine uh, i'm assuming Carl Grunart, though, was not included. It's too bad. I don't know if any of those guys got published in the American magazines. Probably not. I mean, due to the obvious political tensions between right. the two. Mm. Yeah, it, it would have been nice to see. But we're going to get more into the amazing stories in a later episode. But I don't know if they did any contemporary stories in translation. But I suppose we'll find out when we Yeah, do we can look into it a bit more. But it doesn't really seem that way. But... The illustrator for the early issues was Frank R. Paul, reportedly imaginative, but mocked for his inability to draw people properly. So I think, Nate, that's something you already noticed when you commented on the cover 
for the June 1927 issue, which is the one we will be talking about yeah, shortly. It's a, it's a very confused cover, and we'll link to the issue of Amazing in the bibliography section, where you can both see that and the other stories which appear in this issue. And I think it's a very interesting historical snapshot, both in terms of the contemporary works published and the reprints he did of the classics like H.G. Wells and Edgar Allan Poe and things like that, which appeared in the pages of Amazing a lot more frequently than you might think. Yes. Brandt was responsible for selecting the reprints for the magazine. They did get pretty much Poe was all in the public domain at that point. And Jonesback worked a deal with the publishers of both Wells and Fern. And the Fern works were actually original translations for Amazing, though I doubt they were very good, given what we know about Burn translations at this point. Yeah, I don't think Butcher speaks highly of any of his predecessors, so it's likely to assume no. Yeah. So, all three of those classic authors were featured in the first two issues. An important addition early on was the discussion, or letters column, and this became a very active public forum where fans could debate and discuss both science and scientific excuse me, scientific fiction topics. I it won't really say that doesn't ever roll again. the tongue at all. I mean, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I remember having to recite it a few times to get ready when I had to say it in our last discussion about Winger Harris. Yeah, nobody yeah. can say it on the first try. Even people who have seen the word hundreds and hundreds of times, it's just I know. not a good word. <laughs> no, so it didn't stick. But the fans' addresses were printed in the column, so private correspondence and fan networks were established. And this is where, essentially, fandom began. So, new stories were slow to come to Amazing, though the writers were certainly there. Jersbach did actually worry about literary quality, quoting a letter received from one of his early writers, expressing the concern that the magazine might become too scientific and not literary enough. And I think by that he mostly meant the second of those things. Uh, and it seems strange that Jonesback would worry about this, considering his policies, but that's the thing. He had trouble attracting talented writers, many of whom were already writing for magazines like Argosy and All Story. And these magazines paid consistently and well, something which Jonesback always seemed to struggle with. Many writers complained, and he was sued on more than one occasion for lack of payment which forced him to sell many of his publications over the years. Even when Jonesback was lucky enough to acquire second reprint rights for an author like Edgar Rice Burroughs, which he did for The Lamb That Time Forgot in 1926, his payments were just pathetic, around quarter of a cent a word. So how do you expect to retain good authors doing this? He managed to alienate H.P. Lovecraft as well, who gave him the wonderful nickname Hugo the Rat. And to add greater perspective, what's thought to be the most popular serial ever published in Amazing was E.E. E. Doc Smith's Skylark of Space. And this was a very early example of a space opera. The manuscript was all told around 90,000 words and Jernsback paid $125 for it after publication. That works out to less than a seventh of a cent a word. And I think that was so. split into what, like three or four issues or something like that? Yes. Yeah, definitely. It was definitely split across multiple issues. So the serial was hugely popular, and later, Jersbach left the editorship largely to Dr. Sloan. And this was a man who was sort of backward looking, and while reputedly an affable and agreeable sort of person, he wasn't really a science fiction fan. But even though that was the case, he recognized Smith's popularity and offered him a much more extravagant three quarters of a cent per word for the second Skylark sequel. So only new writers or scientists wanted to write for Jernsback and his reputation was just bad. Nevertheless, in December 1926, Jernsback did a thing he was quite fond of. He announced a contest. This was based on an already drawn cover, which we already sort of discussed by Frank R. Paul. Now, Nate, why don't you tell us what that cover looks like? So the cover, yeah, the cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
things to cover, that's for sure. <laughs> so, we are on some, like, planet somewhere. The sky is, like, a darkish purple. The main figure in the center frame is, like, this guy in a toga-looking thing, but he has what looks like a piece of, like, clear plastic around his face that I guess is yeah, supposed to be it's a... it's like a veil. Yeah, or even like a grocery <laughs> store bag, almost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does look like a bag just over his head. I'm, I'm assuming it's supposed to be like a spacesuit or something, but he's got a pistol of some kind that appears to be firing a weird blob at another weird blob. So the creature he's firing at is... Composed of several circles, I guess maybe eyes? eyes, yeah, and there's a giant tentacle coming out of the thing. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> it looks sort of like a flower, yeah, in a way. Yeah, the, the eyes are like petals, yeah, they kind of come out. The center is this uh, circle, a green circle, and a tendril is emerging from that. It's very fuzzy, is, it's yes, very fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> And there's some veins in the middle of it and stuff, but in the background, looking at this scene is, like, a very puzzled Martian with, like, huge eyes, like he had just done the hugest line of coke ever. Uh, <laughs> he's green, and he has, like, boxer shorts on. Behind him is, like, a guy with a weirdly proportioned torso who also has, like, a blue skirt thing. And then there's, like, this woman behind him who has, like, long flowing red hair. She's in this, like, almost, like, classical dress, but the cuts are weird. Like, it's definitely showing more of her figure than, like, a historically classical toga would. And then there's these, like, pillars that I guess could both double as, like, columns, but also, like, futuristic structures like there's odd lights that you really can't yeah. tell if they're like reflections of something or like maybe they're small like... windows yeah and exactly and there's like all these like weird green heads that appear to be like i don't know they kind of look like lettuce or cabbage coming out of the ground or something i guess they're like <laughs> i think they are other martians like... yeah with yeah, the eyes coming out yeah so it's a very i don't know there's also like some other guy with a a very Germanic guy with like this, a like lumberjack, yeah, <laughs> fate like, looking man, yeah, <laughs> with very like a very <laughs> yellow beard. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it's definitely a very busy cover with a lot of stuff on it. <laughs> a I, lot of moving parts. Yeah, exactly. I don't really get the theme here, but it's crammed with stuff. <laughs> I guess the story tonight could kind of yeah. apply it to maybe. Okay. Well, our story tonight is the third prize winner. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, okay, so... Maybe it won third prize because the others just captured the image so I, I, well. I guess so, yeah. We'll, we'll have to yeah. read the other two on our own time to find so, out. So, I'll get to this. And I might read them. And you guys can join me if you want. We can do a bonus episode where we read the other two contest <laughs> winners. But this was an already drawn cover by Frank R. Paul. And the idea was that the contributors wrote a story inspired by the cover design. The first and second prize winners were The Visitation by Cyril G. Waits and The Electronic Wall by G.O.R. Fox. And our story that we're actually talking about is the third prize winner. That is our already visited author, Claire Winger Harris, and her story, Fate of the Posidonia. So this was one of six stories she published in Amazing. And she supposedly stopped writing any science fiction after 1930. Her most popular tale in the magazine was apparently The Miracle of the Lily, which I have not read. But Gretchen, I think you have read this one, right? Uh, yes, that is the other uh, Winger Harris story I've read, besides the two that we read for this podcast so far. Okay, yeah. And I think that one of the reasons that... So this was... I want to back up for a second. This was actually not originally planned to be on this episode. And we had listed everything else that we did tonight, except this story. So this is sort of a surprise. And I guess it was a combination of the fact that we had a little bit more time and the fact that I just kind of thought, hey, we're lacking a little bit in science fiction content, except for the Grunert story. And 
I thought Martian Spies, hey, this kind of fits. Oh, and it, it definitely has a great companion piece mm-hmm. to Martian yeah. Spy. I thought, yeah, this is a very well chosen one. Not only did I think this fit in here, but this is also actually a story featured in the big book of science fiction, which we've mentioned before and done. I think at least one story from, and we'll be doing some more. This is a big anthology edited by Anna Jeff Vandermeer that we've referred to before, and it's got a lot of, I think pretty much a story a year from, you know, around, I think the first story is H.G. Wells, The Store, actually, so I can't remember what year that came out, but it's close to 1900 and 2000 and something. And so really interesting chronology of the genre that includes a lot of non-English works, actually including a German author who we'll be talking about next episode. But this story is actually in that book, and it is the third prize winner. I have not read the first and second prize winners, and like we just said, hey, maybe we will read them. I'm kind of curious now. I want to see if they're closer to the cover design, maybe, but maybe not as good (laughs) from other perspectives, you know? I mean, this story was included in the anthology, so they're pretty pretty thorough in their editorship and picking stories that are significant but also kind of good and i guess we'll go right into the the talk about the story but the story is one that i read before so this is my second reading of this story and the first time i read this story i don't know i laughed a lot and i i thought it was like i don't know not that well written maybe but here's the funny thing i kept thinking about it and thinking about it and it never really left me, especially in the ending of the story, but certain other other aspects of it as well. And I started thinking, hey, this story is more it's more clever than I gave it credit for, like while I was reading it and kind of laughing at how over the top certain aspects of it are. And reading it again and knowing that feeling, it really reinforced that. And I actually really like this story now. I I do think maybe it's not the best written thing in the world, but There's a certain originality and interesting twist to it. And there's a certain way that I think it feeds off the feelings of paranoia that have been sort of scattered all throughout this episode, maybe except for the Dixon torpedo story, which doesn't really feel like like much. Yeah. Like doesn't Mm -hmm. evoke any kind of emotional emotional response, really. But here, there's a first person narrator and you can really feel you can really feel the tension and paranoia and I think that, and we'll get to this when I talk in the summary, but I think that Winger Harris was really almost satirizing a certain type of protagonist when she wrote this story. And we'll talk about what that protagonist might be, maybe in the afterward discussion. But Yeah, I'm interested to hear what you have to say on that. So uh, what did you all think of this story? Yeah, I thought this was a really good story. I think that the, the twist really does, at the end, really makes it it kind of does add to that the individuality of it makes it pretty unique compared to some other stories and does satirize like you said the sort of protagonist you would have seen in in other science fiction tales of the time yeah i like this fair amount too and while some of the prose does feel clunky in places it does have some really cool ideas and imagery in it I think overall, I liked Runaway World a little better. There's some really awkward prose in here, like especially of the science fiction kind of prose. (laughs) One of the conditions for the contest of the story was, quote, the story was to be of the, oh God, scientification or (laughs) the bad word type. Scientification. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Say it five times in a row. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, say it five times in front of a mirror and Hugo Gernsback uh, yeah. comes back. And... <laughs> but it was to contain correct scientific fact to make it appear plausible and within the realm of present-day knowledge of science. And there's a lot of places where it seems like she inserts some sciency details or whatever to make it seem more what he would want to publish. And as such, it doesn't flow quite as well as Runaway World did, even though The science of Runaway World is, like, a lot more out there and cool. But I think it might be an interesting contrast to look at how a publication like Weird Tales, which a Runaway World appeared in, versus Amazing Stories handled their editing and the manual of style they had for stories and how they wanted to present stories to their audience. 
So this story, this story could have worked in Weird Tales. If, I mean, I don't know. I, it's If she wanted to write it for Weird Tales. But here's the thing, too. Weird Tales, we think about this now at Weird Tales as being slightly, I, I don't know, I do, I guess. But I think about Weird Tales, even though there were, there were some maybe less than stellar quality stories published there, too, in terms of writing style. I would tend to think of it as a slightly more, like, at least with, with some literary aspirations kind of magazine. Well, they published it poetry. It did not sell as well as Amazing. Yeah. And I think that's worth keeping in mind. Amazing sold really well, despite the fact that Hugo the Rat didn't seem to want to pay his authors very well or very often. And the idea of, also, she could have gotten paid $500 for this story if she right. won first prize. Yeah. And... That is an important consideration, even though, yeah, we don't like to think of the capital angle and like how important it is for writers to make money, but it is. It's like that comment David Lindsay made in that other book of his, where like somebody was dismissing a piece of work as a potboiler and, and the, the girl in the book says something like, oh, and I suppose you think that artists shouldn't have a pot to boil in or something like that. Yeah. And it, it is unfortunate because I think a lot of this stuff does get dismissed and there's a lot of things to talk about and really go into with authors like Claire Winger Harris and some of the books on women in early science fiction do get into the, their biographies and how they worked in the industry. But for the stories themselves, there's not a lot of recognition and discussion and that kind of thing around a lot of the amazing era stories yeah mm -hmm. and i think an interesting thing too is that there's actually i mean yes compared to the amount of male writers maybe there's not that much but there's actually a quite large number of women writers writing for these magazines yeah and mm -hmm. the problem is nobody talks about them that's that's the problem not that there weren't any so much but that people don't talk about weird tales in particular i think they published something like 150 or so women in the pages of the magazine in the initial run amazing stories was a bit less but yeah yeah the, a lot of those stories really just don't get any kind of recognition and i think a lot of them should because a lot of them do have literary merit with some really interesting ideas including this one even though some of the prose does feel maybe not the greatest at times it does convey some really interesting concepts that will play out more in the genre going forward. Going back to that that idea about less women writing for Amazing, I just want to repeat what Gretchen read the last time we did Claire Winger Harris on the podcast, which was The Runaway World, where, no, this is actually for this story, in Amazing, that Hugo Jernsback said, and this is a backhanded kind of weak compliment, that the third place winner should prove to be a woman was one of the surprises of the contest for as a rule, women do not make good scientific fiction writers because their education and general tendencies on scientific matters are usually limited. But the exception, as usual, proves the rule. The exception in this case being extraordinarily impressive. Yeah, that's what he had to say about that. But she wasn't the only woman to write for the magazine. Leslie F. Stone who also got featured in the big book of science fiction, was another contributor to Amazing shortly after. And she even said that seeing Claire Winger Harris's name in the magazine more than once is one of the things that convinced her that, hey, maybe I should try this too. Maybe I would actually be successful. And Stone, if anything, is a little bit more collected than... Claire Winger Harris has a larger body of work. So this was actually a beginning phenomenon among the pulp writers. I mean, yes, women writing gothic horror and the weird tales was not a new thing, but writing actual science fiction, perhaps more so. Perhaps that was perceived as more of a, a young boy's thing at the time. We were talking about the runaway world. I actually think I... I don't know. Plot-wise and story-wise, I like this better. I do agree that, that some of the writing in Runaway World was better than this. I think that maybe she felt a little more free and unconstrained writing Runaway World, but I didn't really like the way that story ended. I didn't like the abrupt way it wrapped up. It just seemed like a big setup 
for, and it was just like very front ended, front loaded. Mm -hmm. We got a happy ending there, and I don't think the ending here is so happy. Right. Yeah, the ending here is actually, and and see that that's a funny thing too because I would have expected this magazine to go more for the positive kind of ending, and I I almost think. Now I'm not I'm not suggesting that the editorship of Amazing was like oblivious to like some of the things she was trying to pull here, but I wonder if she thought they might be kind of thing. I don't know. And I'm not saying she's like making fun of the readership or the genre or anything like that, but I, I kind of there's a lot more satire here than I would ex expect from a story of this type in this time period in this magazine. Yeah, I mean, Amazing had only been running for like a year at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty early on in the magazine's run. Galaxy Magazine in the 50s, like, that was kind of... So, I mean, by then, you had many science fiction publications and a few of the well-known ones. I can't remember when Amazing stopped publication, but by then it was kind of not really uh, considered an important front runner. I mean, they must have ran until the 50s at least, right? Yeah, and I don't think it was considered a very important front runner again at that point, and... Astounding and Galaxy Magazine's were a thing. And Galaxy Magazine published a lot of the, like, the satires and the kind of the social science fiction stories. Whereas Astounding, they did some of that too, but they were more like, more of the harder sciences. Interplanetary exploration, though, was in, a thing in both. But like, I don't know. I mean, they, they published Robert Heinlein for the first time and, and Asimov and like, actually, I think Asimov got published somewhere else first, but that became like kind of his home magazine. But they all wrote a little bit for Galaxy, too, and Galaxy was, like, more of the social satires, kind of clever political statements kind of thing, stories. And this almost makes me think, hey, it's really too bad that she stopped writing science fiction. I mean, she lived till the 60s, and it would have been interesting to see her continue on into the Golden Age and see if she'd really, really been interested in developing that and developing her talents as a science fiction writer. Yeah. It doesn't really seem to be something that she wanted to do for whatever reason. But this story has a lot of promise, and I, I actually, like, I am torn. I, I am a fan of style, and I do think The Runaway World was more, it had some real grandiosity in the writing that I liked, but this one had a little bit of that too at certain points, and this one just seemed like, better plotted and better the ending didn't leave me feeling oh so that's it like <laughs> the earth is around a new sun now and everything's fine there's like 60 billion dead people but that's fine yeah <laughs> oh yeah the orbits of mars and earth are reversed now so yeah <laughs> this one just seemed it seemed like she wrapped it up better it's like runaway world had a awesome beginning that wasn't really it wasn't really brought to fruition in a way that satisfied me. And this one had a great ending. And the beginning was fine. We'll get to it. But so, I mean, I think we can we can all agree, right, that our, our protagonist in this story is an extremely uptight person, right? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to summarize this story. And I just want to make this clear. One, I think you should read this story. Two... I'm going to be laughing at this story a lot, and maybe we all are. Don't take this as a a criticism. Like, this is really good, but it's also pretty silly. It's hard to explain. It's it's one of these things that I guess a lot of people dig nowadays, where it's kind of like, you know, you're aware of something's kind of potentially not that great qualities, but you still think it's great. And in this case, I feel almost like the things that are not so great about this are intentional. I don't know about the clunky science bits that, that were added. Yeah, she was working to a writing prompt. So, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a writing prompt, but a cover prompt. Right, right. But it's also a cool creative challenge. I mean, I was going to say, I like the idea of the contest. I think that's great. I mean, when I was in grade 8, I had a con I entered a thing like that. And there was no picture, but the name of a story was The Old Abandoned Barn. And we all had to write a story based on the idea of the old abandoned barn and of course i made mine a sci-fi horror story because you know why wouldn't i right and as the old saying goes a picture is worth a thousand words and if you can pay a fraction of a cent for a word well <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly exactly okay our story takes place in the far future of 1995 
Martel the Martian. We already mentioned him. Who's he? Well, we already don't like him because our uptight protagonist, George, doesn't like him. He has an instant, almost instinctive dislike. Why is that? Well, they meet at the home of Professor Stearns, who is delivering a talk about Mars. George is a student at Austin College. Martel and Stearns are talking, and our man George instantly gets a bad vibe. Hostility, or antipathy, is how he describes it. Yet, he's quick to point out that Martel would have been quite passive about the whole thing were it not for circumstances. Martel even looks weird somehow. Stern introduced him as a kindred spirit, a stranger in town, which seems a weird way for a professor to introduce someone. I mean, wouldn't you talk about the papers he'd written or the posts he'd held or something like that? No, he's just some guy that happens to be passing through that likes Martian stuff. <laughs> and Martel seems reluctant to shake hands. No wonder. His hand feels like a dry sponge. George behaves himself for now. But he's seething because he has to sit next to the stinking Martel. In the darkness of the room, Martel's eyes seem to be glowing and staring at him. The weird stranger seems affected by the pictures or map of Mars it's thrown up on a projector. And Stearns thinks Mars has man-made formations, talks about it like it's obvious. Also, the intermingling of land and water makes figuring geography difficult. But it does seem that water may be a scarce commodity on Mars. Somehow the canal-like structures denote this. And he says, the Martians will die soon, but not without a fight. And they'll find a way to prolong the species. Martel cuts in and he says, oh, it's even a worse situation than Stern suspects. And they both agree that they hope Mars has figured out a way to solve its problems. Martel agreeing a bit mysteriously. Now, George is having problems seeing his girlfriend, Margaret, and there seems to be a rift building. And he also discovered Martel is suddenly his neighbor at his bachelor quarters. And he sees Martel and Margaret together at the theater. The horror. Why? He's so ugly. But he can tell that she's into him. He confronts her a few days later and spews all sorts of venom towards Martel. And she admits he's not the best looking, but she admires his forceful and interesting personality. No. George thinks. They cannot be friends. George already knows this. He knows that Martel hates him, just as he hates Martel. Now all this time we've been getting, we've been getting all sorts of indications that George mostly keeps to himself and doesn't have too many friends and doesn't bother with his neighbors. Margaret's apparently been talking about George with Martel, and Martel says he appreciates George's non-inquisitive nature. And well, hearing about this, though, angers George, who's instantly suspicious and resolves to do some snooping, because this Martel must be up to something nasty somehow. Now it's New Year's Day. The New Year New Year's Day. This is one of those odd asides where she starts talking about how they changed the New Year by adding an extra day that was just New Year's and that wasn't part of the regular calendar. Just kind of a neat concept. So, speaking of the calendar, this is like a very weird point I had with the story of when this takes place. Because like you, I assumed that the story takes place in 1994 to 1995, but what was printed in the magazine is 1894, and then it like 
jumps in the text to New Year's Day of like 1945. So like, I didn't see any of that. Where did you get that from? I I read uh, the original scan of Amazing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I I read it in the big book as Basf, and I didn't see anything like that. I just saw 1995. But there was a thing about the New Year's Day where where they added the extra day to the calendar that was just for that purpose. I wonder if the Big Book of SF or if she revised the story or or, or what happened. Yeah, because I know that Winger Harris released like an anthology of all of her stories, like a collection. So maybe she fixed it when she published it again? It could be, yeah. There were only like a few references. There weren't that many references to dates, but I, I think I did see... They were all over the place. And I was like, is this story really meant to take place over the course of 50 years? No, it's it's like a few months. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a few months. Yeah. I pulled up the the scan. I looked it up on Internet Archive, and I yeah. see it. It does say, at the time of my story, in the winter of 1894 to 1895. Yeah, that's obviously not right. You know, it's it's obviously supposed to be set in the future. Or at least that was what I thought. Yeah. All right. I don't know. That's weird. That's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it, it's very obvious to me that the story was supposed to take place in the future. You know, like, even he talks about having an air... He talks about having an air car, for fuck's sake, right? Like, Yeah, so, okay, so what she says is that the the new calendar, the, of, of the new, new Year's Day calendar, that practice started in 1938 and presumably continues to... 1995. Oh, yeah. Okay, but yeah, then, I see. Th then she mentions 1945 later. I, I guess that was a misprint that had me confused for most of the story. I did get the thing about the, the calendar being revised in 1938, and I actually had written that down to comment on later. But, yeah, that that was... I got that part. But, yeah, the, the, the story is supposed to be 1990s. Yeah. That was pretty clear to me. I don't know. It must have confused people if, in the original magazine, it said 1890. Yeah. Four. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it definitely says at the time of my story in the winter of 1894 to 95. Okay. So he's awoken and he hears, he's annoyed because he hears mysterious buzzing voices from Martel's room. And he looks through a keyhole and he sees a horrible thing. He's communicating through a small cuboid shape speaking in an unknown tongue. Amusingly, George's first thought is to assume it's sort of some kind of spiritual apparatus, thinks he's talking to the dead, and then he starts worrying if Margaret's involved in something evil or devilish. Oh, no. He actually thinks diabolical schemes, which has an interesting double meaning. <laughs> and this part was cool, actually. This also made me think of H.P. Lovecraft with The Whisper in Darkness. I can't remember the character's name, but he's visiting Akeley, after having written all these letters back and forth for, like, so long. And Akeley's, like, talking about how the aliens are cool and, and like, right, actually they're going to send them off to Pluto or something and he's going to be a head in a jar and it's going to be great. <laughs> and somehow he overhears, like, he overhears the buzzing speech of the Migo and they, they start talking about uh, Shubnigaroth. <laughs> and uh, it's just this really weird thing, and I just remember reading it for the first time when I was like pretty young, and you know, there's these weird voices talking, and I can't remember if it's a recording that he hears or if he actually overhears them talking. I feel like it was a recording or something. It was in a, some kind of ceremony or other, and he found the recording and he played it, and I was like, it kind of reminded me of that. It was like this really strange interloper coming in and hearing like alien plans, right? Yeah. So he calls up Margaret on the phone, and she sounds weird. He has something to tell her. So he goes over immediately. I don't know why he thinks he's so convincing, but he says, I saw Martel talking in a weird language. She says, thanks, don't worry about it. And he's pretty dissatisfied. <laughs> he wants satisfaction from her. So he's not getting it, and he goes back home presumably in a big huff, leaving them both disappointed, and spend some time the next couple of days watching through the keyhole. And the devil machine, as he calls it, has this vapor around it when Martel is communicating, but not otherwise. Then, one day the keyhole is plugged, and he has a sheepish moment where he thinks, oh, maybe you shouldn't be spying on other people's affairs anyway, but it doesn't last long. 
He has to save Margaret. He knows it's feeble while he's saying it, but he still says it to himself. Now one day, in April, something weird happens in the world. The Pacific Coast reports the waterline decreasing by several feet. Apparently, several thousand tons of water have been displaced or misplaced. And there's a hint that something big is coming that will change everyone forever. That is in the text. So we're actually receiving something from the far future of this story. Water, perhaps, becomes more valuable than gold. Now, why would that be? Well, Margaret's been ignoring George for months and seemingly doesn't care for him anymore. One day in the summer, though, she calls him up and seems agitated. And so he rushes over, thinking things are going to be better. She's realized... I'm reinstated as her favorite. But wait. At first he doesn't notice, but Martel himself is also there in the room, lying on a sofa, unconscious. He almost leaves right then and there. Martel. Mentioned George before passing out, apparently. Nothing doing. The doctor shows up. Can he recognize a strange biology? And George walks off and goes home. Again, in a huff. This didn't really come to anything. I don't know quite what happened to Martel, why he went unconscious, or why he wanted to talk to George. It's not really made clear. I feel like there's there was a little bit missing, maybe. For, like I mean, not literally missing, but there was a little missing that could have been filled in in the story because I wanted to know what Martel thought he was doing and why. And Harris never specifies, but George, he's at home. And he's listening to the radio, and he's hearing a report of a passenger plane disappearing from the sky. And a single survivor saying they were yanked up into the rarefied atmosphere, and maybe beyond. And there's no indication it came down anywhere. This is where George does pull a funny thing. He calls up the front desk, and because they're staying at a hotel, he calls up the front desk and says, Oh! Mr. Martel's ill at a friend's place. Can I have his keys? I just need to bring him something. And it works! Straight to the weird machine. And time to start pushing buttons. Yeah. I, I love this part. He just, like, randomly button mashes. I know! <laughs> so he's just like, and, and, and there's something really wrong with this person. Like, he has he has this, like, compulsion to push all the buttons. Like, even though he kind of realizes what's happening. Like, he's smart enough to figure out what he's doing. Yeah. And he's like, okay, maybe I should stop now because, like, I'm alerting everybody to my presence. But he's like, he can't stop until he's pressed everything. Yeah, he's like, I have to get to the last button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there's, like, five levers and one dial. So he pushes one, and he sees a beach scene with a red man in three dimensions before him. And the red man looks like Martel. And when the figure raises its arms, George sees, with astonishment, that it's not wearing a native headdress, but actually has feathers. So he pushes the lever back to the off position, and then the devil machine device starts to ring, and George guiltily doesn't answer the phone, but waits till the party disconnects, and pushes another lever. And this one gives him a view of what looks like a Martian, possibly in Germany or something, reading a paper. And now George is enjoying himself, and he keeps going, playing with the phone, as you will. But it's no good. Everyone on the Martian network has caller ID, so they're all calling him back, and oh no! Their footsteps coming! Oh! Oh, it's nothing. Okay. Back to pushing buttons. Got to try all of them. Not a moment to lose. Very urgent. Now he's comparing himself to Sherlock Holmes. But wait. Now we're looking at Turkey or India or something. There's a mosque at any rate. That's as much as he knows. Number four calls him and he doesn't answer. But feels compelled to try that lever next. He's too obsessed with being systematic. And that's his problem. One of his many problems. 
There's a particularly cruel Martian on the end of number four. A leader of Martians, perhaps. But now, his own real telephone is ringing in his apartment, and he must answer. It's Margaret! Come see Martel! Uh, okay, I was just in the bath. Give me a minute. But guess what? George just runs back into Martel's empty apartment, determined to try all the buttons. Actually, all the levers are now glowing and buzzing at once. So, he managed to piss everyone off on the network with his prank calls. Or maybe they could hear him breathing over the line even. Wait, could they see him? I don't know. Do you think they could see him? I guess they could see him, too. I thought they could. I thought so, too. Yeah, I got the impression it was like a two-way communication thing. Yeah, because it seemed to be that it seemed to be that kind of video phone or whatever. Yeah, which is, like, awesome for 1927. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really cool. So, well, there's still a dial he hasn't tried, so George is going to do that. His sequence of doing things isn't the smartest. So, he twists the dial, and there's a long connection hiss, and... Then he has an aerial view of Mars. He knows it's Mars very slowly, being pretty stunned and unsure about things at first, but there are two moons, and the people are looking at this green star, which has definitely not waned, and they're working on something. There's an exultant shout. At this point, I have to ask, why are there only four levers for earth stations when there seems to be five earth stations that doesn't seem to be something that has been <laughs> thought through in the like like presumably if they made these devices for a specific kind of network they would be interchangeable so there should be five <laughs> levers on the box but i don't know she also specified that number five is a dial and not a lever like the other one. Yeah. Oh, number five is... No, but number five is the dial for communicating with Mars. Yeah. That's the subspace communicator, right? And the four levers are the intra communicating, you know, like the, the right. local network. Yeah. Right. So there should be five reachable nodes on the network. That's yeah, what yeah, I'm saying. Right, on the right. local network. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is... The concept wasn't really developed yet i guess i don't know it's, just, it's interesting that i thought of that really quickly i'm like well why isn't there a fifth lever that there should be because there are four remote stations that he's contacted right his should be the fifth one yeah but it shouldn't be like his box shouldn't be unique you know like it should be the same it makes sense that the same thing would be issued to all the martian spies right well i don't know maybe they had like a really extravagant engineering department and they can like custom make their dials for the situation or something like that <laughs> maybe yeah i don't know i'm overthinking this probably but it just it was something that that cracked me up a bit like there should be five but anyway between the planet and the visible moon great martian aircrafts ascend also they have the pegasus that plane that got lost locked into a giant sphere and oh, I wonder what that green star is. Uh-oh. He's lost track of time, our George. And now someone is coming at a run. Or several someones. Quick, shut it off! Oh, yes, it's Martel with a bunch of police and the hotel desk clerk. Quick, arrest that man! I did not give him permission to enter here and spy on me! No, no, he's a Martian spy! Arrest him! And while all this hysteria is going on, and George is being handcuffed and led away, he appears to suffer a nervous breakdown or something and faints. So George finds himself in the local Institute for the Insane. And this was a fun direction that I remember the first time I read the story a year or two ago. Because I was reading from the big book of SF, just sort of randomly, and I wanted to read a lot of the early stuff. This, I didn't expect it to go here, you know, it was kind of this, like, staple of gothic fiction, right, is the, the lunatic asylum. And here he is, in the lunatic asylum, pleading for release. Won't help. His neighbor insists that he is Socrates, and flops over every time he drinks a glass of milk. For some reason, the keeper lets him see a newspaper. Is he trying to taunt him? 
The paper has headlines of another great ocean recession, this time in the Atlantic, and the loss of a great passenger ship, the Posidonia. This story could be called many things, but the fate of the Posidonia is what was chosen. Which is kind of strange, but I don't know. I get it, because as we will see, something important has happened. Anyway, there's also plenty of environmental destruction described and massive marine casualties, which she points out, which is cool. So the Martians are hardly innocent. They suck the Posidonia up in the clouds while the wireless is still operating and details of the crafts are given. The newspaper is weird, listing the ocean recession first. So again, it's like something that I kind of commented on before with one of those Italian Gamma One movies. I can't remember. I can't remember how it came up, but I think it was on an early, early-ish podcast episode. And it was just this funny scene in one of these Italian space movies where there were like three things that went wrong. There's like a weird radiation leak showing on some kind of Geiger counter. One of their scientists has gone missing. And oh yeah, there's an alien fleet coming in on the port side or something like that. And they're listed in that order. And it's like, shouldn't the alien fleet be first? Doesn't it seem like the most important thing in the room? <laughs> it's like, oh no, the radiation leak. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe some priorities have to be straightened. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess that ocean recession is pretty important, especially when, like, the result is probably thousands and thousands of dead fish and things. But I don't know. It just seems weird. It seems like if you noticed an alien, like, a whole bunch of alien craft in the skies, like, that would probably be the first thing that you'd want to put in the newspaper. Yeah. But, yeah. but <laughs> she mentions the ocean recession before. And again, it gets back to this weird issue of what date it is. And they might have corrected this later, but I'm looking at the text of Amazing Now, and Chapter 3 opens up with the 6th of April, 1945, was a memorable day in the annals of history, especially to the inhabitants of the Pacific Coast cities throughout the world, because the ocean line had receded several feet. And then she goes on to say that May and June, presumably of the same year, had marked little change in the drab monotony that had settled into her life. And then mentions the that she got the phone call from Margaret in July. Uh, so yeah. I don't know what happened with like the dates in the amazing version of the story. But yeah, the ocean thing is mentioned before in this weird temporal way. Well, this the, so the first one was in the Pacific, right? Yeah, right. And it was in the early part of the year. Now we're later, we're like like several months on past the summer, and now they've struck the Atlantic. Yeah. And yeah. it's in 1995. Yeah. It definitely says 1945 in the amazing text. <laughs> I don't know. That's really weird. Yeah. I don't know. That's uh... Uh, Yeah. Maybe the editor got confused or something, but date issues aside, it's also a really weird and cool plot point of like transporting an ocean. You mentioned that we name check Doctor Who a lot on the podcast, and this particular issue <laughs> uh, really reminded me of the Faceless Ones mm. and a, a oh, lot yeah. of the themes and vibe that it has when we get to this part of the story. And up to this point, I was wondering why the story was called The Fate of the Posidonia. Yeah. So I thought of the Faceless Ones earlier because that is actually a, a word, a, a phrase that comes up in spy, like spycraft. The, the, the yeah, Faceless right. Ones are the ones, the ones that operate with no faces. And they, yeah. Or they can change faces, you know, and they're like, but yeah, no, it, it, it was that aspect. It was pretty clear when I read the story. I don't know. Um, these were published, I guess, presumably in her collection that was released in 1947 apparently by a so-called vanity press which was apparently the only place she could find at the time to publish her stories so maybe that publication doesn't have the misprint i don't know but it was fine in the big book of sf like you know it's, it's, i don't know so she probably submitted a manuscript to amazing written 1995 consistently but the editor I guess initially coming across the story for the first time and not realizing she meant to set it in the future, even though it's a science fiction magazine, probably corrected the first date to 
1895, thinking it was just a typo or whatever. Yeah, that's that's uh, and then, uh, that's so weird. Doesn't this woman know that 1895 <laughs> hasn't happened yet? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe her penmanship was such that a four looks like a nine, and they corrected the 1995 the April of 1995 to April of 1945. Yeah, this is why, like, for the purpose of our podcast, like, this is why, unless we have a case of a story that's so rare that it's, like, never been reprinted, I'm in favor of not using original magazine printings because I think a lot of the time the authors in their own collections and in, in later collections have the versions of the stories that they really intended. And I think that sometimes, perhaps, the magazines don't do justice to what they were doing yeah i guess it's kind of interesting how sloppy amazing was for this yeah i would have not have necessarily <laughs> expected that That's, yeah no I, I would say i guess because some of these pulp magazines were so they had to turn them out quite quickly amazing at this point was that i believe a bi-monthly schedule i think it was once a month at this time they asked this in the letters column and people apparently like many many people wrote in and they wanted i don't know how when they converted to bi-monthly but at some point they were doing that or trying to so i don't know if this was by then i guess not because it was june yeah and the, the next issue was july which has like the hg wells and edgar Allan poe and abraham merritt Right, right. A lot of the big authors are in that one. So, so I mean, obviously, some of the, the, the editorial work on these magazines was not great. <laughs> that seems to be a fact. So, George manages somehow to convince the Keeper that he's less wild than those other guys. And he should get Stearns, please! However, when the professor shows up, it's not long before George is yelling. And eventually, it's all right, though. And he explains the theory to Stearns. His theory is that Mars is stealing Earth's water. And it's a concerted effort via the network he's discovered. Stearns seems to believe him and says they must employ the instruments of war, which have lain dormant for many generations. Yet another indication, of course, that this does take place in the future. War is mostly a thing of the past. Ah, but George still can't be free just yet, and his hope is dashed quick. It turns out that Margaret and her family were passengers on the Posidonia, and he receives a delivery, a box, from Martel. It's got a card on it that says, for Gregory, which is George's last name, in remembrance of Martel. And it contains the Devil Machine, which now is inoperable except for dial number five, which puts him in communication with Mars. Now, instead of empty gullies and chasms and crags, or streams and canals and greenery, they did that fast. They also have the Posidonia trapped in that giant sphere. And Margaret. She goes to the viewer and addresses George. You were so suspicious and jealous that I went with Martel in order to bring you to your senses. It's kind of an awful thing to do, but hey. What's really awful is that Martel has killed her parents and everyone else but her. Saving her to bring with him into his civilization. She's sad, but seems kind of okay with it. It's strange and wonderful here on Mars. And the Martians are satisfied now with the water they got. So, Earth need not fear anymore. And then Martel appears and snuffs out the machine. George can't get it to do anything again, no matter what he tries. Seems that Morgan was hinting at future communication between them, but, of course, with no machine now, that's impossible. And it's just left like that. What an ending! Yeah. She went off with the Martian, and she's kind of okay with it. Yeah, I mean, it's a dark ending. Definitely a case of Stockholm Syndrome, I think, in a lot of ways, and... yeah. 
I mean, we don't know how much she really loved her parents. Yeah. <laughs> and she did seem know. into Martel to begin with. So yeah. maybe she just likes the whole thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it sounds cruel, but I don't know. Maybe she didn't like her family that much. Doesn't have to be Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> the end bit was a bit of the very silly science type stuff. Like, really transporting an entire ocean by, like, airliner like how big are these airplanes going to be where transporting any water across millions of miles would so be... assuming i'm assuming they have some kind of like i guess what we now call a tractor beam yeah which apparently was something first mentioned in i think one of ee e. doc smith's books right <laughs> but yeah like I, I assume what they did was actually like they were able to suck up the water molecules somehow and yeah, transport okay. them. But haul a big ball of ice across a couple million miles. Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, whatever, right? Like, <laughs> I, it's not really explained, but I'm assuming it was something like that, right? So I think the structure was also quite similar to the Runaway World. Like, there's a kind of a character that doesn't appear elsewhere in the story, and like this one though seemed better in the sense that at least George is present in both parts of the story. Like he's. He's always our focus, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Uptight George Gregory himself. And he's just awful, isn't he? Yeah, he's not a likable protagonist, I don't think. Yeah, you don't feel too bad the way he winds up. It's not, you don't feel that awful about what happens to him. If there's anyone in the story you would feel bad for, it would be Margaret. Yeah, I feel because... bad for Margaret. <laughs> if yeah. it is a case of Stockholm <laughs> Syndrome, like she's the one that has it the worst and yeah. the one you would feel sympathy for. Right. I know, yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, though, like, I don't know, Margaret, like, okay, so so George is, like, I mean, okay, Martel's sort of nasty, you know, he's, like, a little bit nasty in general, and, yeah, like, they just captured the, they captured the plane and the ship, and they killed everyone, apparently, and they're keeping her as a kind of trophy, I guess, although maybe Martel is going to pay her special attention, and, yeah, that doesn't seem too good, but, like, George is so xenophobic right from the outset, right? Like, he just, oh, this guy just, he looks weird and he can't shake hands properly. Like, there's obviously something nasty about him. Yeah. Right? Like, it's just so, uh, and I feel like it's on purpose. Like His hand feels weird. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw a theory on the internet somewhere that Jane Austen novels are really horror novels in that we get a <laughs> female protagonist who is stuck with all these really shitty choices and it's going to make her life torture and she has to choose wow. the one that will be the least torturous. So I wonder if Claire Winger Harris is going for that here where Margaret has to choose between George and some guy who literally kills her entire family and transports her off the earth to a place that is yeah. millions of miles away. And she chooses Martel because, yeah. you know, he's dark and mysterious and he has a forceful personality. But he's also maybe not, I don't know. I mean, who knows, right? In her perspective, somehow, he's not as much of an asshole. So, yeah, like... Yeah, like, he may have killed my family, but maybe in his day-to-day -day life, Martel isn't that bad. I yeah. can tolerate him more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, you know, maybe being the only Earthling on Mars is kind of an attractive possibility. Sure. For somebody. Especially where Mars is not a dry, desolate desert that is totally mm -hmm. inhospitable. But, like, I guess this, like, lush green place that now has a new ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I have fun with this. I think this is really fun. I, I liked it more the second time, and... In the intervening time that I had between the two readings, just like the fact that it never really, it never really left my mind, I think just speaks to the fact that it's actually pretty good. Again, it is a little bit clunky in parts, like you said, Nate, I don't disagree with that, but I've definitely seen a lot worse. I oh, think yeah. the <laughs> Dixon Torpedo, yeah. you know, was like way, <laughs> way worse, right? Yeah. And that was published in The Strand of mainstream. Sure, yeah, of course. Like, good magazine that yep. published H.G. Wells and Arthur Conan Doyle and like Sherlock Holmes has you know? literal replacement yeah 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 no I mean this has a lot of good stuff going for it I really like the cool 
communication device. Oh, yeah. Even if it should have had five local network nodes. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's, like, (laughs) got smoke and stuff, and it's, like, ah, man, it's so cool. And the disappearing aircraft, I really like that idea of derelict air, yeah. aircraft goes again with doctor who it yeah, reminded right. me of like, uh, uh it's, it's so cool that peter davison story time flight yeah with the disappearing concords right right yeah that, that i mean it's a story that people make fun of a lot but yeah and the ending that feels like a downer and even if it's the way you interpret it not a good or a bad ending it's certainly a dark ending no matter how you slice it and i think that's yeah. interesting for a magazine like amazing that probably had a Younger, more nerdier audience trying to get them to think about these kind of heavy concepts. Right. And I think not only is it the ending, it's not even just that it's dark, but that it subverts the expectation. Right. Like, we expect that he's going to rescue her yeah. and take her back home. Yeah. And that doesn't happen. And arguably, the only reason it doesn't happen is because he's such a jerk. Like, <laughs> and here's the thing. What did Martell want to tell him? We never found out. And in a way, it feels sloppy that we never found out. But at the same time, it's like, well, maybe we never found out because George just wasn't willing to listen. Maybe it was actually something significant. Maybe it could have taken things in a different direction. But we don't know. Because George is George. And George is just going to be uptight through the entire story. So, I don't know. I want people to read this. I I think this is a, a good one. There's a lot of stuff published in Amazing around this time, and maybe a lot of it is not very good. Obviously, some of the early writers, like Edmund Hamilton, and also David Keller, who was an actual practicing psychiatrist, and did write more social science fiction than you would expect from Amazing. And I've read a few of his stories, and they're pretty good. So the thing that I pointed out before about Amazing having a lot of trouble sort of attracting writers with any kind of literary ambition makes sense, given the fact that those writers would be snapped out by other magazines. And at this point in the 20s, at least, like maybe not so much by the 30s and 40s, but at this point in the 20s, there was not really a stigma against science fiction. There was a stigma developing over time against magazines like Amazing Stories. And... H.P. Lovecraft, unfortunately, Mike Ashley says that, and he's somebody who's done ex- very extensive histories of the pulps that we've consulted a few times, but most recently because we're sort of getting more into this area now of the pulp magazines, the American pulps. Mike Ashley says that H.P. Lovecraft was not only alienated by Hugo the Rat from wanting to publish an Amazing again, where he actually did publish, I believe it was The Color Out of Space. He was alienated enough that he actually avoided science fiction magazines in the 30s. So he could have actually written for Astounding or something Mm. and probably been successful. And here's the thing. We've talked a little bit about Lovecraft before, and I'm sure we will be again. And this isn't his episode, but I do want to bring up that I have been thinking a lot about the end of Lovecraft's career and where he might have been going had he not died in 1937 at age 40. And... I think that he was going in a more science fiction direction. And I think that if he had continued to write in the 40s, he would probably be more known as a science fiction writer. Maybe not more known than he is as a Weird Tales, like a weird fiction writer, but that would be a thing. And certainly some of his stories in the 30s are very heavily science fiction. And I feel like, yeah, it's unfortunate that he probably felt, oh, that market just like cheap, hack editors who don't do their jobs and don't pay right and like lovecraft was living very 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 frugally at that time don't forget it's pretty much boasting that he could allow a can of beans to last for like five days or something like that like he was he was not a wealthy man by any stretch so somebody who was doing this for a living being paid was obviously very important and Amazing just wasn't cutting it. And I guess magazines like Astounding, although they were a thing, maybe weren't established enough. And we'll be getting to Astounding soon enough. So does anybody else have anything they want to add about the fate of the Posidonia? No, I think we've covered a lot of the really good points about it. It has its drawbacks, but I, I think it's still a pretty entertaining story and worth the read. Yeah, absolutely. 
we are all individuals, right? So we don't like we don't really meet beforehand and decide on a consensus on how we feel about stories. And this, in a way, probably was my personal favorite. Now, I, I guess, like you know, it's, it's kind of something that I enjoyed coming back to and just felt good about. So between and it's interesting too because all that spy fiction background, as interesting as it is. We are a science fiction podcast, and the stories tonight that are the more science fiction stories were, to me, the more, they were sort of the more interesting. And, I mean, there's plenty of good straight spy fiction out there that doesn't have science fiction elements, but, like, it's never been my particular go-to in the way that science fiction has. So, to see this sort of really connected with the spy tropes, which I think these stories did these two stories i think they really did i would say so yeah definitely yeah i think that was that's been a really cool thing and again very good companion pieces to one another like if you read the two back to back i think you'll have a very enjoyable experience yeah it's funny i don't imagine claire winger harris read the martian spy oh it's unlikely it's completely unlikely. it seems almost impossible but the two stories work so well together it was just great that it was possible to add this story into this podcast because I think it's just such a nice way to cap off the discussion of spy fiction and bring it into the science fiction realm, along with The Martian Spy. Yeah, definitely. I really enjoyed this one. All right. So, for the next edition of Chrononauts, we will be taking a most pleasant dive, once again, into the worlds of weird fiction. Weird fiction with strange scientific twists. We will be discussing Malvu the Helmsman by German author Paul Schiabart. We will also be discussing An Unfinished Communication by Charles H. Hinton and The Pikestaff Case by Algernon Blackwood. I'm really looking forward to bringing Blackwood to the podcast because we almost did that before, but it didn't happen. And we have talked about him already, but we've never actually discussed him on the podcast. And not a lot of his stuff really is considerable as science fiction, but maybe a few things. And certainly some of his occult detective stories might be. But we're also going to cover, with great pleasure for me, The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson, who we've already visited on the podcast. This is the longer work that we will be covering on the podcast. If you have not read House on the Borderland and you are listening to this podcast, please read House on the Borderland because it's amazing. Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I've never read it, but it, it sounds so cool. So I'm yes. very yeah. interested in how this next episode is going to go. Yes, I am very excited to read this. I It's been one I've been meaning to read for quite a while, but I'm glad to finally have the chance to get to it. Yeah, I can say ahead of time that it's it's certainly one of the most creepy, atmospheric, weird, dark, sort of horror stories with great cosmic implications from the 20th century, for sure, that I've read. So it's going to be awesome to cover that. It's going to be right up there, I think, with Voyage to Arcturus in terms of just being really mind-blowing and psychedelic and weird so yeah i think we've got a great bunch of stories next episode and for the next couple episodes we got a lot of cool stuff planned so definitely stick around yeah i'm really excited guys i'm really excited but now sleuths and investigators remember your code books don't be too obvious with your signals Beware clerks with poison pens, and watch out for tourists with camera bow ties. But most of all, I bring you a warning. Every one of you listening to our voices, tell the world, tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch for spies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching for spies.